We are honored to have my friend and yours with us today. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished and accomplished speaker, Lawrence Blessing. Sixteen years ago, a woman started a walk, a walk for America, a walk for campaign finance reform, and 13 months later, 3,200 miles later, she arrived in the cesspool we call our capital, Washington, D.C. She saw a cause and she walked. Now, of course, Granny D was not the first walker in the history of social protests. And 2015 turns out to be a very important anniversary year for walkers. It's 60 years ago this year that the citizens of Montgomery launched their bus boycott. In Montgomery, buses were organized like this, the front section reserved for whites, the back section reserved for blacks, and if the back section was full, the front section was full, and a white needed a place to sit, the blacks had to step up and stand and leave the seat for the white person to sit in. One woman said no to that idea, Rosa Parks. And when she was thrown from the bus and prosecuted for her principled objection to an obviously unconstitutional regulation, Thousands of citizens across the city joined her in the bus boycott, which for poor people in the South meant that they spent months walking to work rather than riding to work on a bus, a fight expressed through walking. And it's 50 years ago this year that the extraordinary fight in Selma occurred, Selma, Alabama, where the struggle to register voters had reached a climax of tension. And the leaders of that movement decided to march the 54 miles to Montgomery. And they saw themselves in that march, opening the eyes of a nation to the injustice. But the injustice that was delivered on them opened the eyes of the nation to the incredible wrong that was practiced in the South. They saw a challenge and injustice, and they walked. Now, it's critically important for us to recognize something, which sometimes we talk about as if these two things are different, as if these two struggles are different. But what we need to see is that these two struggles are struggles for the very same thing. They are struggles for equal citizenship. They are struggles to be equal citizens. They are struggles about a moral principle, a moral principle of equal representation. And moral struggles express themselves not in the words, what will I get? Moral struggles express themselves in the words, this is right. And the most important, the most foundational moral struggles use the word right to refer to a common ground that unites all people within a community. And in our culture, in our political tradition, the common ground that reaches all the way back to Jefferson's declaration is a common ground of equality. Not the equality of the Soviets equalizing people as if everyone deserves the same of everything, but the equality of equal status, the dignity of equal status as a citizen that's necessary to make what the framers called a republic work. Now, African Americans, of course, had been denied that equality, that equality and many other equalities, but that equality too. In 1870, our Constitution was amended to expressly grant African-American males at least the right to vote. And for a hundred years, okay, it's an exaggeration, for 95 years, 
there was a concerted effort to exclude African Americans from this constitutionally granted right to vote. In Selma, in 1963, 1% of African Americans were registered to vote because to register in Selma required passing a test if and only if you were an African American. And that test asked questions such as, name all 67 county judges in Alabama. Or, when was Oklahoma admitted to the Union? Or my favorite, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? If you failed to answer those questions truthfully or honestly or correctly, you could not be registered to vote. To vote, the essential attribute of an equal citizen. That's what Dr. King was saying. So long as I do not firmly and irrevocably possess the right to vote, I do not possess myself. I cannot make up my mind. It is made up for me. I cannot live as a democratic citizen observing the laws I have helped to enact. I can only submit to the edict of others. Now we have to recognize there are lots of ways to deny the right to vote. We should distinguish the crude from the elegant, as in the evil genius sense of elegant. And in the evil genius sense of elegance, the evil genius way to deny the right to vote, Texas was at the very top. Texas had a regime that said blacks can vote, but they can't vote in the Democratic primary. A state that was overwhelmingly Democratic ran an all-white Democratic primary, leaving them to participate in the ultimate selection of the candidates but not free to participate in the selection of the candidates who could be selected as the representatives. So there's a two-stage election. All citizens could vote, but a primary where only the whites could vote. Two stages with a filter, a racial filter between the two, excluding a significant portion of the population, close to 15% in Texas, excluded from the choice of that first, critical first step of the election, meaning that those citizens excluded were unequal citizens. And the consequence of that exclusion, obviously then, was a democracy in the South that was responsive to the whites only. But different from the consequence, the status, the status of that equally obviously was a regime that was simply wrong. Wrong from the perspective of the ideals that had defined what this nation was about. Now this particularly tricky technique is a technique you've been told about by my friend John Pudner. It's the technique of disenfranchisement de jour that's spreading across the world today. And it has a founder, an inventor. You'll be proud to know it's an American, as John told you. His name is Boss Tweed. I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. We should name this system Tweedism. Tweedism. And recognize Tweedism wherever we have a two-stage democracy with some filter in the middle stage. And that filter is a bias filter a bias filter that excludes in a way that cannot be justified. And the most recent dramatic example of this tweetism, of course, comes from Hong Kong. We've seen the incredible protest in Hong Kong triggered by a decision of the Chinese government to describe a method for selecting the chief executive in Hong Kong. Hong Kong had been promised a democracy for ch selecting the chief executive, and in August, the Chinese committee released the rules that would specify how this election would be made. They said the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon a nomination by a broadly not representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. So there's a nominating process, the nominating committee makes it, 
And there's an electing process where all the citizens of Hong Kong get to participate. And so the nominating committee is the filter. Now, who is this nominating committee? Well, the nominating committee is 1,200 citizens of Hong Kong, which means out of a country of about 5 million is about 0.024% of Hong Kong. 0.024% get to make the decision about which candidates will get to run that the rest of Hong Kong gets to select among. Now, 0.024%, for those not mathematically adept, is a very small number, tiny. And we should get a sense of just how tiny. So if we imagine one person being represented here, that one person would be one out of all of these people here, one out of every 4,125. That's what 0.024% looks like. This tiny, tiny fraction gets to decide who the candidates are that Hong Kong gets to select. It is a biased filter, activists in Hong Kong said, because those tiny 1,200 would be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. This is the tweedism that triggered the strike. of Hundreds of thousands across the city demanding something better than this tweedism and recognizing that that system produced a world of unequal citizens and protesting against that wrong. Okay, now, there's something critically important for America to recognize, and it's hard for us to see this, because it's hard for any nation to see something so fundamentally wrong about itself. It's the sort of thing Granny D saw she would have described it like this, but it's the sort of thing that we find it hard to accept. And that thing is that democracy in America today is again tweedism in America, again. But a tweedism of a much more fundamental kind than anything the South ever saw. Because campaigns in America, as you know, are expensive. We take it for granted they will be privately funded, which means the candidates spend endless time raising money to get elected. As I've written in my book, the estimates are between 30 and 70% of a member or candidate's time is spent dialing for dollars. As a psychologist at Harvard taught me, this image of the Skinner box maybe best describes the life that they lead. Any stupid animal can learn which buttons it needs to push to get the sustenance it needs. This is the picture of the modern American congressperson as he or she learns which buttons must be pushed to get the sustenance the campaigns need. Now, as they go through this process, where they must first get funding before they can get elected, it is the funders who get to vote before the citizens get to vote. There's a filter between the two. And that raises the question, is that filter biased? And the answer is it depends. It depends on who the funders are. So in 2014, these are the numbers. 5.4 million Americans gave at least a dollar to any congressional candidate in 2014. 5.4 million, which means about 1.75% of America contributed something. Less than 2% contributed something. But of those that contributed, 0.2% of the contributors gave 66% of the money contributed. And of the contributors, including the super PACs, the top 100 contributors gave as much as the bottom 4.75 million contributors. So we start with a very small slice of America giving anything, and then the reality that those who give are divided among, between those who give a lot and those who give a little. So when we see that difference, we think, well, who are the relevant givers? Who give enough to be noticed? Whose will or views would matter to the candidates as the candidates decide what their views or actions will be? And so just think, what amount would have to be enough for someone to qualify as a giver who matters. Let's take this as a statistic. Think of the percentage giving the maximum contribution permitted to just one candidate. So in an election cycle, you can give in the primary and in the general. 
That means you can give $5,200 in one election cycle. So let's think of all those who give at least $5,200 in one election cycle to one candidate. Now, you might say, those people don't really matter. It's people who give the $10,000, or the people who give $100,000, or people who give $1 million dollars to super PACs. Maybe, but I'm saying, if it's the people who give $5,200, how many people is that? And the answer is, it's 52,000 people which magically works out to be the same proportion as in Hong Kong. The people who give the maximum amount to one candidate is 0.024% of the voting population in the United States. The same percentage who sit on the nominating commission in Hong Kong. So we com they complained that the committee was dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. The complaint that we have here is the green primary that we've set up in America is dominated by a business and economic elite. The United States, in this sense, is Hong Kong. The majority has been excluded from this critical first step, producing unequal citizens. We are unequal citizens. And the consequence of that is a democracy responsive to the funders only. This Princeton study, which I'm not allowed to talk about Princeton studies, so let me put that off the stage really quickly, by Martin Gillens and Ben Page. The largest empirical study of policy decisions in the history of political science, tracking actual decisions by our government, relating them to the views of the economic elites, organized business interests, and the average voter. This is what they found. With economic elite, this is the relationship. So the bot on the bottom, it says percentage favoring a proposed policy change going from 0 to 100. It's intuitive that as the percentage favoring it goes up, the probability of it being enacted goes up too. So that's what the black line is, the probability that it's going to be enacted. So economic elites seem to get their way, at least when they can get together and all agree on something. Interest groups, basically the same graph. Probability goes up as more interest groups align. So those are two graphs showing responsiveness of the political system to the views of those special groups, the economic elite or organized interest groups. Here's the graph for the average citizens. It is literally a flat line. And what that flat line means is that regardless of the percentage of average citizens who favor something, it doesn't change the probability that it will be passed. If we happen to agree with the economic elites, then of course we're going to ride along with the economic elites and it will get passed. Or organized interest groups, it will get passed. But we have no independent influence on whether it will get passed. Translated in English, they put it, when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule near zero statistically non-significant impact on public policy. In a democracy, the average voters' views do not matter. That's not ideology. It's not rhetoric. It's not just ideology and rhetoric. It's statistics, too. It is data demonstrating what we have feared for so long, that the system has evolved to a place where we no longer count. And what's the consequence of that? Well, Bard professor Pavlina Cheneva constructed this graph to map the distribution of average income growth during different recovery periods, so after recessions. The first of these recovery periods, 1949 to 50, 1953, this is a division. So what this is saying, the blue bar represents the percentage going to the bottom 90%. And the red bar represents the percentage going to the top 10%. So this is saying the bottom 90% got 80% uh, of the gains, and the top 10% got 20% of the gains. Not even, not even, not equal, but still not dramatically far from their percentages. Here's how that graph changes over time. So in the last recovery, the top 10% got more than 100% of the gains. They like 
cupped it out from the last recovery. They took some of it from the last recovery and pulled it up, and the bottom 90% lost relative to where they were in the last games. This is a radical change. And as Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson describe in this fantastic book, Winner Take All Politics, the reason for that change is a series of changes in government policy. The government changes rules about how to tax and how to regulate in ways that affected that radical change. And as I argue in my book, those changes in government policy are tied to the corruption that we're talking about here. The consequence is a system that is not responsive to those who don't pay for the campaigns, and the status of such a system is just wrong. This unresponsiveness is because of this unrepresentative democracy. And it is unrepresentative because the power of those in this democracy is so unequal, which means we are unequal citizens. That is not just bad. That is wrong. It is wrong. Granny D would have seen this inequality. But maybe more striking, the framers of our Constitution would have seen this inequality too. As James Madison described, ours must be the government that would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. The people. Well, who are the people? Obviously, he wasn't thinking much of blacks or women. So who were the people? Well, as he specified in Federalist 57, by the people he means, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. And what's striking about this is a political culture that was oblivious to the issues of race oblivious to the issues of sex, wouldn't even have known what LGBT means, was still fundamentally committed to an equality of class vis-a-vis -vis the political system. This one they got. But this one ideal of equality, which was theirs, is the one we have forgotten. Indeed, forgotten so dramatically that our Supreme Court writes as if to recognize this inequality or to address this inequality is to violate the First Amendment, a complete non sequitur, if ever there were one. This is the fact we must learn to accept. We are not equal citizens. We are not equal citizens. And what that means is that we lose. In every fight that we have a stake in, we lose. But the meaning is not that. What that means is that we have lost the moral claim to be a republic. It's exactly that absence of a moral claim that led the first Tea Party to attack British ships in the Boston Harbor. The taxation without representation claim was the claim you have no moral right to regulate us because we are not represented in your parliament. But that is the claim we can make against the government that says to regulate us now. And that is the fight we have to find a way to take up. When they faced the inequality they lived, they walked. When she saw the inequality we were inheriting, she walked. And when we have been reminded and rallied to recognize the inequality which is all around us now, we too walk. We walked last year from the top of the state to the bottom as one group. We walked this year from the top of the state and the corners of the state and the bottom as four groups. We walked. We, like she, Granny D, we, like they, those who fought for civil rights, put our bodies on the line. But unlike the Selma protesters, we didn't face the hatred of a sheriff like Jim Clark. On our walk, the only encounter we had with the police, a woman who pulled up with her lights blaring, rolled down her window and said, is there anything I can do to help you guys? 
But like the people of Selma and the world, as people from across this state saw us and heard about what we were doing, they wondered and they thought. And certainly, unlike most whites in Selma, when they understood what we were demanding, they supported us. This is who we are. We are GD Walkers, Granny D Walkers. And last year we described a unit. It's called 1GD. And 1GD is 3,200 miles. <laughs> Granny D covered 1GD. And we, last year, last January, covered 6,581 miles. That's two GDs. <laughs> and in July, the incredible march, 16-mile march uh, on the coast, represented 8,352 miles. That's 2.6 GDs. And this January, we have crossed 12,081 miles, representing 3.8 GDs. B. We've collected 8.41 GDs as a team. And what we want to do with the energy this generates is to rally to this thousands in this state who will present, who will ask, who will push this basic moral question to ask the question of the candidates who come through to force them to confront in a moral, not a partisan political, but a moral way, this one question, what reforms will you advance to end the corrupting influence of money in politics. Not to take sides, not to push any specific reform, but to turn to our wannabe leaders and to ask them, what is your idea? Because this is the thing about leaders in America today. We have to lead before they show any leadership. And that's what the New Hampshire rebellion is doing, rebelling against the way they would talk to force them to show us whether they can lead. I can't begin to describe how grateful I am to all of you for what you've done, for those who have walked. And for those who have walked, you can't see, but imagine you can. Can you stand so others can see who walked on these walks today? And can we applaud them, please? and to Jeff and to Dan and to the team leaders who took this idea, this small idea, and turned it into something incredible. This is an extraordinary accomplishment that has been done here in New Hampshire and will change the way democracy happens. This is what I know. I know this from the passion that these people show. I know it from the recognition that people across this state demonstrated to us. I know this from the truth we repeated just yesterday, that King taught us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends to justice. I know that if we can talk to each other again, the way this conference has brought people from the right and people from the left to talk to each other again, we can bend it quickly. I know this, and I tell myself this. I feed off this. As I suffer, as we all suffer, the pains of this struggle, not just the physical pains, but the social pains, the difficulty of living a normal life as crazy Larry, as we struggle and suffer this, this knowledge that we will succeed makes it possible. Because however great the suffering is, this is nothing compared with the suffering of our forebears. We don't need to go to war to win this republic back. We don't need to face Jim Clark or Bull Connor's dogs or Jim Crow racists. No assassin will fell any of our leaders, and however cold Pinkham Notch may be, that pain is tiny when compared with the struggle of an 89-year-old woman crossing the Appalachians walking. We will do this because you are here. A crazy idea 
first uttered in a blog post, sparked this, because it is right, because this cause is true, because just is what we teach our children to be, and because we love. I told this story before that I was brought to this point to launch this walk because I felt that I had failed someone I loved. That the boy who Aaron Swartz was needed us and we failed him. And in the moments when that recognition made it impossible for me to work, to think, to do anything but cry. I resolved I would not let anyone, anything I love, down like that again. Here is our other common ground, all of us, progressives, conservatives, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, independents. We all love this country. We have been raised to believe in its ideals. And it hurts us. It hurts us to see it less than it can be, less than it was promised to us to be. We love this country. We love our children who will inherit this country. And nothing will stop us from saving it, to save them. And so we walk with love for our country, to honor our grannies and sons. We walk for an end to corruption, till the will of the people, the people, the people, not the rich more than the poor, the people, till the will of the people be done. Thank you ever so much. God blessed us with Granny D. God blessed America. Thank you.